that you can mount it when I start now. It's amazing what is found in the pages of the Bible. When I started to um, meditate on Exodus chapter 17 last week or from the beginning of the week, I thought to myself, surely we will finish this class in 30 minutes. That was what I thought. Hi, Prophetess Jacqueline. Thank you for joining the class. Good morning. Hey, Tina. Good morning. God bless you. I thought surely Exodus chapter 17, I will finish it in 30 minutes. So I was actually planning to do something else. Precious, good morning. Thanks for joining the class. But last night, hi, Emmanuel. Good morning. Thanks for joining the class. Last night, I started to actually study to prepare for this class. And I realized that if we wanted to spend three hours in Exodus chapter 17, verse 1 to 7, we can it's amazing what is in the Bible. And more and more and more, I see the reason why as children of God, we must study this word for ourselves. There are so many gaps in our Christianity because we don't know the word. I mean, I've been teaching the Bible for a while. So when I say I want to teach Exodus, my instinct is I know it. But when, since we've started, it's amazing the things that I've seen. Hi, Evelyn. Hi, Tosin. Thanks for joining this class. Always a pleasure to have you ladies and gentlemen with us. It's so much that, you know, when I finished this morning, I was just overwhelmed. For those of you who follow me on Facebook or on Instagram, you would have seen just a snippet of what I saw in Exodus chapter 17. I was like, wow. You mean that this particular Exodus 17 impacted upon why when Joshua became the leader, you know, when Joshua became the leader of the children of Israel, God changed the modus operandi on him. Because Moses led in a certain way. But that was not a very effective um, way that Moses led. Moses led by power. And when you check the way that Moses led, every single step of the way, he had issues with the children of Israel. Every single step of the way. But they were the ones that saw a display of God's power more than any other sect of Israelites. Yet they were the ones that gave more trouble. This morning, I found the answer. Hi, Stella. Good morning. Thanks for joining the class. It is amazing what is in today's class. I am so excited I can jump. I am so excited that I want to beg you, please invite your friends. Share this video. I believe that there is a rema here today that can set many a person free. Amazing what is in Exodus chapter 17. So that I don't keep saying amazing, amazing, and don't tell you what is in Exodus chapter 17. Maybe we should actually go into this scripture. I want us to look at verse 1 to 7. I think that that's all we can take today. Exodus 17. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. Now, this one verse. I can do one hour on this one verse. First and foremost, the children of Israel continued their journey from the wilderness of sin. If you remember last week, we said that you might be going to the promised land, but periodically, and you might just have left, um, what is it called? Elim. God will take you through sin. He will take you through places that don't look like he's there. Because he wants to prove us. And remember, I, we talked a lot last week about the fact that sometimes we come into God and all we are looking for is the bread. And God gives us the bread because he wants to use that particular bread to test us. So we closed last week in the place where we saw that for 40 years, God gave the children of Israel manna as food. Every single day they will go out and, and gather manna. Every single day they will have food to eat for 40 solid years. Now, those years did not end in the wilderness of sin, okay? Because it was a transition until they got to the edge of Canaan. It was when they actually stepped into Canaan, the manna seeds. So even this journey that they continued into Rephidim, they still had manna they were eating on a daily basis. Do you get it? But you know that the way God set it up. Hi, Bumi. Good morning. Thanks for joining the class. Thank you so much. Amen and amen. So you know that 
the manna, every morning they will wake, manna is there, they will take it, they will do what they need to do. In the evening, quails will fall, they will take, they will eat. So they had food. And so they didn't need to carry the food from one place to the other. Now, this journey that they continued in Exodus 17 verse 1 took them through places. You know, sometimes when you read the Bible, you think that they just left sin and they arrived at refuge. No, that was not happened. They left sin and then they went to, I wrote them down because I wanted us to see. They went to Dobka. Then from Dobka, they went to Alush. It was from Alush they came to Rephidim. So this is not a journey of, again, seven days. This is not a trip they've been on. Remember, they traveled this travel for 40 years. But the Bible comments that they continued to Rephidim at the commandment of God. The first thing I want you to take today is when you are on a journey to destiny, when you are on a journey to becoming the best version of you, when you are on a journey to become that person that God has called you to be, he is the one that tells you when to go. He tells you, he's the one that tells you where to stay. Most of us run ahead of God. We get in trouble. Most of us run when nobody is asked us to move. We get in trouble. Most of us sit down when God is le has left. Which was why he was training the children of Israel by the pillar of cloud uh, by day and the pillar of cloud by night. So that they will get used to the fact that you don't just go. You go when God moves. Praise Jesus. So the first thing I saw here. Hi Elizabeth, good morning. Hi Louis, good morning. Thanks for joining this class. The, the, the reason why they went, they started, they went on to Rephidim was because God had moved. Do you get it? Now, if I ask us here, how many of us move? Because God, or how many of us know? Scratch that. How many of us know when God moves? Which is why we don't get the best out of our Christianity. I'm telling you the truth. And it happens to the best of us. So nobody is immune. How many of us, how many of us know when God moves? Someone says, I keep saying double. Unlike, do you get, some of us, God moves, we don't even know he has moved. So we travel, we journey, only to find out that we begin to sweat. Then we begin to look around us. <laughs> Usually, God will cover us with a pillar of cloud. Where is he? Then we we'll, we'll suddenly realize that we left him at the left, last place. He had not moved when we moved because we were excited by the things, the prospect of where we were going. So the first thing I see in Exodus chapter 4. Hi, Matthew. Good morning. Thanks for joining the class. In Exodus chapter 17, is that they journeyed according to the commandment of God. I know people, for instance, let's talk about tithing. Who pay 30% in tithe? I know people who have given testimonies that concerning a particular earning, God told them, pay 90%. The, every other person's journey is 10%. Most of us don't even do the 10%. And then God picks one man and says, do 90%. Now, if that man decides not to walk according to the commandment, he will be doing 10%. And he will not be getting the increase that his DNA desires for him to get. Why? Because he was not journeying. He is not traveling according to the commandments of his GPS. Which person wants to go from here to, let's say, Korudu? Has never been in Korudu before and decides to use Google Maps. You've never been there before and you get pathway. Google Maps says go right and you go left. We obey technology, but we don't obey God. We obey doctors. If doctors gave you chalk, because we've heard stories of doctors who place their, their, uh, their patients on placebos. That is, they look like medicine, but they are just like flavored something. They, they have no medical component in them, medicinal component in them. Because the doctors could tell that what was doing the patient was psychological. It was not physiological. Do you understand? So they place them on placebos and the patients begin to get well. We trust doctors who place us on placebos sometimes. But we don't trust the God 
whose instruction never fails. We get up, we move. Five minutes later, we're tired. We sit down. Meanwhile, God says, continue to go. If iPhone, if you have an iPhone or you have a Samsung, I send you, they send you the um, Play Store, um, sends you a notification, update your app. What do you do? You update. God tells you update. I'm not eating. You are asking me to update. In Jesus' name. Amen. We will know God for ourselves. Amen. No longer will any man have to tell you that God is there. Go there. You will know God for yourself in the name of Jesus. Amen. I was just telling someone, I said, when you know God for yourself, you are effective in whatever they throw you at. Check the men and women who followed God in the Bible. There was nothing that they couldn't do. Any assignment that they showed up concerning, they excelled in. You will know God for yourself in yeah. Jesus' name. So verse number one, they journeyed according to the commandment of the Lord. Then they pitched their tent in Rephidim. Look at what follows. It says, and there was no water for the people to drink. Praise the Lord. The God who could rain quails. The God who for 40 years delivered manna. And they never had a situation that the food didn't go round. And remember last week I told us that the only way someone would be able to eat manna for 40 years is that manna was whatever they needed it to be. If they needed manna to taste like beans, it would taste like beans. If they wanted it to be like pancakes, it would be like pancakes. If they wanted it to be like jollof rice, it would be like jollof rice. I don't know whether you get what I'm... That's the only way you can eat the same food for 40 years. Are you telling me that this God, that in Elam five minutes ago, gave them how many wells? Tw 12 wells and 70 palm trees. Are you saying that this God could not have created water in Rephidim? I was looking at it. I was looking at it. I was looking at it. I couldn't sleep because I knew they were not talking about water. So I said, the Holy Spirit, show me. There is something else you're talking about here. There is something else you're talking about here. There is something else. This is not about ordinary water. Lord, there is something else I need to see. And the Lord opened it. Oh, God of heaven. I just want to just stop and give God praise. I want you to help me thank God. The one that doesn't leave us bereft of his presence. The one that knows what you need and he shows up concerning. The, ones that know, the one that knows the rena and the conversation and the information you need to transition from where you are now to the next place. The God who is faithful. The God who is kind. The God who is merciful. The one that takes no delight in keeping his children in darkness I said to him Lord you are saying something else can you please tell me what it is and when God showed up oh Jesus hmm. praise the Lord now when you read before I get to when you read that there is no water the children of Israel were journeying. They got to Rephidim. There was no water. Now, the first thing I need you to recognize about physical water, I will start from physical water, is that it's been said that someone can go without food for so many days. I'm not sure the number of days now. But I think as much as a month. Hmm? Two weeks. Two weeks. You, I hear that people can go without food for, th for two weeks. And they won't die. But you can't go without water for three days. By the third day, if you have not drank water, you become delirious. So imagine that the God that had been carrying them, the God that parted the Red Sea. Do you notice that since we started Exodus, it's one miracle after one miracle after one miracle after one miracle. So in the scheme of things that of the things that God has done, water is nothing. But they got to this place and there was no water to drink. So I said, Lord, what are you saying? So he said, because I commanded you, I'm the one that commanded you to go, does not mean that you will find water at, at every spot. That's what he said to me. He said, just because it's God that told you to go on the journey, does not mean that 
it will just be chicken all the way. Sometimes you will not find water. But he now said to me, he said, it's, but it's what you do when you don't find water that will make you recognize what is more important than physical water. So I was looking at him, I was like, okay, Lord, what are you saying? What, what is in, in, in Exodus 17? Because honestly, it didn't look like there was much. Because I saw that in verse 2, immediately they couldn't find water. They started to complain to Moses. One scripture says, they contended with Moses. They murmured, they quarreled with Moses. They got to the point that they said to him, that thing they always said to him, they say, you mean you brought us to kill us? I don't know why they always say that Moses brought them to kill them. But that was what they said. And I'm thinking, how can Moses take his brother and his family, take his sister, take his own family, and bring them into the wilderness to kill them? Who is Moses? How can one man bring close to a million people, if not more, into the wilderness and wants to kill them? But that's what the children of Israel said. They murmured, they contended. When I saw the, I felt it was like, I suddenly had a taste in my mouth and it was like bile, it was bitter. And I know, and all of a sudden I felt the bitterness and the anger with which they went at Moses. And I said, Lord, this cannot be about water. He said, yes, it's not about water. It's just that when things are drying up in our lives, we only recognize that they've dried up when physical things dry up. He said, this is not about water. But the problem is people actually just realize that something had dried up when their water dried up. So they said to Moses, you want to kill us? And Moses immediately said to them, why are you always, you know, contending with me? Don't you recognize by now that when you murmur, you are not murmuring against me, you are murmuring against God. After all, is it not God that told us to go? Exodus chapter 17 is about our leadership. The way we lead, the way we let other people lead us, the way we allow ourselves to lead ourselves. That's what Exodus 17 is about. Oh, Jesus. I don't even know that I, I can do justice to what I know. I do, I'm, I'm wondering how I can transfer this to you. But I'm trusting that God will transfer it to you. I know it. By the time I got up this morning, I was full. I, I felt like I had grown an inch or two taller. Because I now know something that has stopped me for years. Number one, the journey is God's. So I move when he moves. Write it down. Number two, the mere fact that it is the journey is God's does not mean that I will not, things will not dry up along the way. Number three, every time a physical supply dries up, it is indicative that something bigger had dried up before. Number four, if I'm traveling on the instance of God, all my complaints, it doesn't matter who I complain them against or who I complain them to, go against God. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Amen. Praise Jesus. Amen. They pitch their tent in Rephidim. The question now is, what is Rephidim? Rephidim means a place of rest. A place of rest. So when you take a look at Rephidim, in its DNA, it is supposed to provide rest for the children of God. Are you listening to me? If Rephidim's name, because remember the last week we said that a name, that ev everything that something is named by speaks to the capacity, the core, the DNA of that thing that, has the, that can manifest. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So if Rephidim is a place of rest, that actually ought to be a place. Like when we got to Elim, Elim was oasis, right? What did we find? We find 12 wells, we found 70 palm trees. If my name is Blessing, that's why everywhere I go, whoever I come in contact with, if they will give me the opportunity, I, they will be blessed. 
Your name, whoever you are in your DNA, you have the capacity to manifest. So Rephidim was supposed to give them rest. How come they got to Rephidim and the waters dried up? How? How? If anything, Rephidim, because it was a place of rest, was supposed to be that place where they found everything that they needed to catch their breath. Praise Jesus. But they stopped at Rephidim and Rephidim had nothing to offer. So they cried out. Because I'm sure that the Hi Detola, good morning. Thanks for joining the class. Yeah, me say thanks for joining the class. I'm sure the reason they joined, uh, they, they rested, they pitched their tent at Rephidim was because someone asked them, they, they probably were pitching their tents by names. So when they saw that this one was Rephidim, something automatically said to them, We can rest here. Only for them to finish pitching their tent tent. Someone gets hung, uh, thirsty and they look around. They can't find water. Praise Jesus. They couldn't find water. And God was saying to me, I will say it again and I will keep hammering at it until you understand what I'm saying today. That every time something physical dries up in your life, it is first of all indicative that something spiritual had died that you didn't know about. Because the life that we have as children of God, hi Pastor Shari, God bless you, thanks for joining the class. The life as, that we have as children of God comes from the inside out. So before your flesh begins to die, something had been happening on the inside that you did not think about. Before your wells dry up, the rains had ceased, you didn't know. Are you with me? I, I don't think you, you hear me. But I'm hoping you hear me. Praise the Lord. Hi, Juliana. Thanks for joining the class. I'm just overwhelmed by the weight of this revelation. And I'm overwhelmed because I, I'm, I'm, I'm overthinking it, actually, because I want it to make sense to you. I want you to take it from here today and be able to run with it. So I'm not going to be looking at my notes. I'm just going to stop thinking it, and I will just go. When you look at, I said that you can go without food for days, but you cannot go without water for more than three days. Physical water. Now, in the spirit, what does water signify? If you open to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 and 27, it talks about the washing of the water by the, blood, uh, by the word. So the water is the word of God. Number one. I need you to listen to me. In Jesus' name, we must get this. Number two thing that water represents is according to Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3 and John chapter 7 verse 37 to 39. In John it says <laughs> Isaiah 12 3. John 7 37 and 39. In John it says that it, Jesus was talking to the woman at the, you know, and, and was talking to them say, um, out of your bellies will do what? Flow the rivers of living water. What does that water in? It's the capacity for eternal life. So I need you to think again and see the things that dried up in Rephidim. It's not physical water that dried up. The word of God dried up upon their lives. The capacity to understand eternal life, which translates to salvation, dried up in their life. Praise the Lord. The third thing that dried up, oh sorry, the, um, the, sec the second scripture is John 4, 24. And eternal life is talking about, you know, um, John 4, 20, 14, sorry. Let's open to it. Um, I'm feeling the pressure of this word. I'm feeling the pressure of this word. John 4, 14. John chapter 4, verse 14. John chapter 4, verse 14. Yes, John 4, 14. Rivers of living water 
John 4, 14. But whatsoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Are you listening to me? But the water that I shall give him shall be in him. What? A well of water springing up into what? Everlasting life. Can you see it? That what dried up in their life was not a cup of water. It was not the river that was running through that dried up. It was the capacity for them to arise as a people of eternal life that dried up. Now, for you to understand what I'm saying, these were the people that did not make it out of the wilderness. These people were the ones that came out of Egypt and last week we saw that they did not enter the, 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 the promised land. They didn't enter. They all died in the wilderness. And why did they die? Because the word of God had dried up in their lives. Eternal life wasn't bubbling inside of them. There was no river or springs or wells of living water that was flowing out of them that led them to life everlasting. Are you listening to me? The top thing that water in the air symbolizes is um, the spirit of God. And that's, that's when you find John chapter 7, 37 to when he was, you know, John 7. Let's go there. John 7. Oh, Lord, just help us get it. Help us to get it, oh, God. I see this stress. I see why we are stressing. Yes, Lois, I can't sit still. I tell you, I'm feeling like there is something here that if the church of Jesus Christ will hear, power will return to us. John chapter 7, 37 to 39. John chapter 7. It says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his bellies, shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, it says, But this spake he of the Spirit, that which they that believe on him should re receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Praise the Lord. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Yes, since the presence of God is heavy on this. It is heavy on this. I did not learn this in school. This was not revealed by flesh or by blood. This is straight from the throne of God. So you find that that word, that water that they were crying. I remember I said that as I was studying and I was looking at why are they so angry. My mouth started to taste bitter. And God said that is the level of bile that the people were feeling against Moses that day. So I now said to him, Lord, this cannot be about what I said. Sure, it's not about water. It's about the word of God that dried up. It's about what eternal life that they were not sure they had. It was about the spirit of God that had not was not liberal upon them. So I asked God, I said, why did this happen? How could this happen? You were with them because the Bible said God went with them day and night. I asked God, I said, how did this happen? How did this happen? And this is what I need you to hear. Please hear me and hear, hear the Holy Spirit. What I heard was, God said, God started to break down Moses' leadership for me. And, you know, I, I shared this with my mentoring class on Sunday. God said that Moses led by power, a show of God's power. Every, everything about Moses' leadership was built upon the display of the power of God. So, he throws down the rod, it becomes a snake. He throws down the rod, he leaves the rod, boys come. He, he leaves the rod, um, flies come. All kinds, he was, he was leading by the, by the rod. And because he was really, uh, leading by the, 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 the rod, the children of Israel saw so much power, but they had no relationship. They saw so much power, that, but they had no relationship. I need to speak to the church of Jesus Christ. Let's talk about relationship. Let's forget about power. Because what the Lord told me last night was that if you have the right relationship, you will not require a miracle. You didn't hear me. You did not hear. If you have the right relationship, 
you will not need a miracle because you become a miracle yourself. So God said to me, it's not. Come, it's not about the water. They lost my word. Really think about it. If you so far we have done Exodus 17. Tell me whether you ever saw any time that Moses called the children of Israel and they said something like they opened the scrolls. Or how many times the, until he went and called, brought the commandments. Moses just would tell them, God said move. God said plague is coming. It was always a display of the power of God. Nothing helped them forge a relationship. The funny thing is that Moses, who was leading them, had a relationship. Because when you get to Exodus 33, Moses had such a solid relationship that he could say to God, he said, if your presence does not go with me, do not take us. Moses had a relationship. Leaders have relationships, but we don't teach our people relationship. So our people are constantly feeding on the crumbs of power. No ma, if they had a relationship with God, they will not perish. They will not perish. They will not perish. 40 years. It was like a wasted journey if you think about it. Every single person who came out of Egypt died in the wilderness. Only their children made it into the promised land. How did that happen? Because they had no relationship. They had no relationship. See, when you get born again, that's what happens. God displays his power to you. He lets you see that he's the God that has been talked about. He shows you the things that he's able to do. But as you grow, you will notice if you walk with God in spirit and in truth, you will notice that you see less and less miracles. Because what now begins to happen is he begins to train you. Hear my voice. He begins to train you. Sit down here, don't get up. He begins to train you. Love my people. He begins to train you. Watch how you speak. He begins to train you. Take a look at your character again. He begins to train you. Watch the people you go around with. Why? Because God knows that his power, yes, is there. But his power cannot sustain us at the level that he wants us to live. So the children of Israel woke up at Rephidim where they were supposed to have rest and something in their spirit man told them something was missing. Oh father father please Anoint our ears to hear today. We need to hold this thing. We need to hold this thing. We need to hold it. We need to hold it. You need it. Take a look at the church. Take a look at the people you know. 80% of our people are broken down. Miserable. Unhappy. Divorcing. Fighting. Stealing. Cheating. Why? Because we have kept our focus on the power when we ought to be pushing the relationship. So when they got to Rez Refidim and Refidim water dried up, it was not the cup of water that they couldn't find that made them so angry at Moses. It was that suddenly and I can hear that very soon Members of congregation will begin to get to the point where they begin to they, are, they will begin to get to refidim. They will begin to notice that something had dried up in their lives. Now, what will happen is they may not even know what is dried up, but they will begin to make a demand on the people that God has called to lead them, that are leading them by the carrot. We are dangling things. Our God has become a God that provides cars. And then we come to a whole church service and all we are saying is receive your car keys. And the person buys the Hummer. The person buys, I don't know, the Range Rover. 
but he's still broken. He's still unhappy. His life is still dry. Let me come down. Praise the Lord. All this is indicative of the fact that when water is unavailable, the believer is lacking. of massive things in their lives. The word of God, an assurance of salvation or of eternal life, and an assurance that the spirit of God, who is the power of God that makes expensive things cheap, resides in us. The people were asking Moses, can we be refreshed again? The only problem is they were not asking for a physical refreshment. They were asking, what they were saying was, revive our spirit man again. The church is screaming by the spirit. Revive our spirit man again. And we are playing, I don't know what we are playing with them. We are playing cathedrals with them. We are playing glass houses with them. We are playing um, monies in the bank with them. A church now quantifies or qualifies how much of God's presence they have by how much money they have in the bank. How can that ever be the measuring stick of what God is doing in our lives? We have taken the focus out, out of the things that God wants us to push. And the devil now has us watching the things that unbelievers get without making an effort. People are running from pillar to post in church to make ends meet. Just so that when the devil takes you from there, <laughs> the moment he has your focus on a cup of water, you can travel for years and not realize that your spirit man had separated from the spirit of God a long time ago. Oh, have mercy, oh God. What the people were asking for was, please, will you refresh us by the word of God again? They were saying, Moses, refresh us. Moses, give us the word. Moses, bring the word to us. That's what they might not have known that was what they were crying for. But what the Holy Spirit told me today was that was what they were crying for. That's what they were crying for. That's what they were crying for. If you only go to church and you can dwell on your phone if the word there has no weight. The word of God cannot be pressing on you and you will be scrolling through your phone. You will not remember you own a phone when the word of God comes down heavy. The spirit of God cannot be bubbling inside of you and then you will be sending WhatsApp messages in church because you will be so inundated, you will be so enmeshed in the thing that you cannot look up. The glory of God cannot show up and then you will be gisting with someone that is seated beside you. But that's what we see. Even the pastor takes time out to have a conversation where he's laughing in church while someone else is ministering. Why? Because the word of God left the tabernacles long time ago. We've turned our tabernacles to make up houses. We've turned our tabernacles to places where we show people the latest fashion. We've turned it. Oh Jesus, help us. So they said, Moses, there's something missing. We are supposed to be in a, a place of rest. This is supposed to be the presence of God, but we can't feel it. We can't feel it. We can't feel it anymore. It has dried up. Moses, do something. Unfortunately, remember, Moses only had power. Moses had not praise Jesus Hallelujah. one of the things that God said to me this morning 
was if you don't have a father, then you can't be trained properly. One of the things that Moses didn't have was well, he didn't have someone who trained him. So he just collected power. Nobody taught him the other processes of leading a people. Because when you find out later, his father-in-law will now show up. That's when Moses now begins to split the people into, you know, you go under this elder. You go. He had none of those things because he wasn't tutored. Moses was tutored by the power of God. He was called by an encounter. And that is great. I know because the Bible also says, if you don't, um, what's the word? If, so, if they don't see signs and, and wonders, they won't follow. But signs and wonders are not for believers. Signs and wonders are for unbelievers. But believers now come, all we are looking for is a sign and a wonder. 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 And the Lord is saying, what are they doing? What are they doing? What are they doing? Okay, maybe today, the 16th day of February 2017, maybe I should lead them to refugee again. Maybe if their physical water dries up, they will come to a realization that something spiritual had dried up a long time ago. Praise the Lord. What do you have spiritually that is sustaining you? Most believers no longer have a word. They have a word of their pastor. My pastor said, my mama said, my bishop said, my apostle said, my, what I, my prophet said. But they have no word. So the apostle, the bishop, the prophet, the pastor has a relationship. So he never experiences dry spells. But he doesn't have the capacity to transfer the processes and the strategies to us. So we are following the apostle and we are still dry. We are following the bishop. We are still dry. We are running hard after the pastor. Everything he asks us to do, we do. We are still dry. Praise the Lord. Every one of us needs to get the word. We need to get back to the word. We need to get back to the word. We need to get back to the word. Get back to the word. Come to church to confirm what God told you at home. Then we get into the activity of church. One thing happens. It becomes the only conversation we have for the next 20 years. So the children of Israel, all the conversation they've been having was the God that parted the Red Sea. Not realizing that that God does miracles every single day. You go to church and all we're talking about is what happened when we started. Are you not still alive today? Why can't it happen today? Have you died? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let me go to my notes. Could it be that like today, many of us, like today, many of, and like many of us, they were not able to get the spiritual sustenance to continue on the journey to destiny. As I meditated, the Holy Spirit had me thinking. He said, think about Joshua. Think about him carefully. Think about him carefully. So I said, think, yes, Lord, what about Joshua? And he said, he said, what did I say to Joshua in, in Joshua chapter 1? At the moment Joshua took over the reins of leadership, two things that God did, 
In Joshua chapter 1, he said to Joshua in verse 8, this book of the law, God took Joshua straight to the word. He said, go to the word. He said, meditate on it day and night. He said, because if you would prosper and have good success, that is where it comes from. He said, bind this word in your heart. Remember again that Joshua took over from Moses. And because God knew that Moses' entire leadership was based on the road, the power, the power, the power, the power, the power, every little thing. When the people murmur, Moses would cry to God. God would say, pick the road. Because the road was all that Moses knew. When he got to Joshua, God wanted a more robust walk with him. So he said to Joshua, pick up the word. Pick up the word. The second thing that he said to Joshua is found in Joshua 5. He said to him, take knives and circumcise them. That is, strip them of old mentalities. Strip them of wilderness mindsets. Strip them of the things that they don't un just strip them and this stripping happens when a man or a woman sits with God to learn we are too impatient in God God says I'm taking you on a journey you spent three months on the journey in your mind you should have arrived where you are going but you did not set the journey God sets the journey, which means that only God knows the destination. How can you at three months think that you have arrived? We are impatient. We are not pushing the things that God has called us to push. Ultimately, we get ourselves in refidim. We are as dry as they come. He said, look at Joshua. It was for this particular reason that I said to them, I said to Joshua, take the word and take the knives. Take the word and take the knives. Take the word and take the knives. Some of us even manage to try the word, but when we see the knife, we renounce God. Is it me that we'll be talking to like that? Am I the one that, you know, how can they... they, they, they? If you will not submit... So a stripping of the wickedness of the wilderness, of the mindset that we only succeed by power. If you would not submit and allow yourselves to be stripped of that, you can't get into the fullness of who Jesus says you can be. And I want to get there. I want to get there. For me, that's what all of this is about. I need to get where God wants me to get to. So I ask, I ask for over two hours. I was looking at verse one of Genesis, uh, Exodus 17. I said, Lord, your Holy, the Holy Spirit is saying there is something here, but I'm not seeing it. You have to show me. We had no electricity. I had to use a rechargeable lamp because I was bent on getting to the bottom of this. Not for you, for myself, first and foremost. I needed to know it. I want to be able to come out tomorrow and say, I'm not moving anymore. My God has legged here. My God has stopped here. I will stop here. But I also want to, even if God took me to the Sahara Desert, I want to be in a position to be able to say that water is bubbling from the inside of me out. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it's about relationship. It's about relationship. It's about relationship. It is not about the power. When you are a child of God, you claim to really know God. And every time you are believing God for a miracle, how are you better than the unbeliever? Who needs a miracle to recognize God? When water is coming out of us, when the word has become flesh inside of us, when no matter what happens, you can stand and say, I am assured that if Jesus comes today, I will make it. You don't begin to believe for miracles because these things just happen. 
I'm telling you the truth. They just happen. You know, a few weeks ago, I put something on Instagram and I said, fruit happens. The tree doesn't write a letter to the fruit to come out. The tap root doesn't send a memo to the, tr to the trunk of the tree to take water. The branches and the leaves don't need a memo from the sun to say, come and get photos. Uh, what's that thing? Yes, photosynthesis. It just happens. All of that calculated so that the fruit can come up. Fruit happens. Miracles happens, happen in the life of the believer. Not because the believer is going up and down looking for miracles, but because the believer is dwelling in the secret place of the Most High God. The reason why your life becomes a constant miracle is because you have access to what other people don't have. It comes by the word. It comes by the spirit. It comes by an assurance in the salvation that you have received. That's the only way it comes. Hey, Pastor Wumi. God bless you, sir. We need to recognize that why miracles work, they cannot sustain the life of the believer. They don't. They don't. Because when the devil shows up in front of your house, you don't throw at him the last miracle. You release at him the word of God. When sickness shows up because the enemy is trying to buffet you, it does not become, oh, did you not remember that two days ago I had a headache and God healed me? You do what? You release the word of God. Yesterday evening I was seated. I was home alone. So I was just seated in my living room. And all of a sudden I just felt a headache here. It was so intense. And I said immediately, I said, no. Another one came a second time. Pam, pam. And I shook my head like that and I said, I said no. Like, um, what's it called? A knife, a hot knife through butter. It just melted and that was the last time I heard it. I didn't need someone to lay hands on me. I didn't need to call my pastor. By the way, I hope you guys know I'm not a pastor. I didn't need my pastor to lay hands on me. I didn't have to call anybody to agree with me in prayer. I knew that all of that yesterday I had done my best to transact with God in the integrity of my heart so I could stand there immediately and say to that devil get out it is not oh headache you want to try me did you not know that I had also and God healed me seven years ago and you don't throw miracles at circumstances when they come you release the word therefore you cannot afford to allow the word to dry up. If you belong in a body where you don't get the word, leave. Sit at home if necessary for some time. Open your Bible. Tell the Holy Spirit, show me. God is so excited. Usually when someone comes and says, Lord, they, they couldn't teach me. I asked my pastor. He didn't, he didn't, his answer was not satisfactory. But I think you, Holy Spirit, you can teach me. That excites God. Because finally he finds a person who is willing to be all that they can be in him. No, ma, the function isn't as important as being a true son of God. Yes, ma'am. So, please, Let's stop. The children of Israel go to Rephidim. But look at the answer to their problem in, in, in John. Out of your bellies which flow rivers of living water. Have you not seen men and women with all their titles? When you look at them, you can tell that something is dry. And then you see someone with no title, with no appellation, with no nothing, shows up and you can see a radiation of the glory of God upon their life. Why? Because they are full of the word and the spirit of God. Let's stop minding the wrong things. Let's stop concentrating and focusing on the things that the, that the Lord allows the, the unbeliever to have without asking. He said, if the lilies of the valley 
who are here today and tomorrow they are not can be arrayed in this beauty. How can you who's created in the image and likeness of God lack anything? How? But we are not done. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Ah. In verse 3, and the people tested there for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to die, to kill us and our children and our cattle with our thirst? Very soon, we will begin, you know, you see, when we see people protesting against government, we actually think that's the ultimate. But a day is coming, and that day is very soon, when people will carry placards against men who feed them chaff. Women who pretend that they know what the Spirit is saying, but they have no clue where the Spirit is. Very soon, we will be getting up, and you will see that people will be walking out of church because they've had it. As a matter of fact, it's already happening. It's just that we are not vocal. People are not vocal about it. People are already living in their droves. Because refidim, the church, is dry. We are not offering anything. When they come, we tell them, can you see the road? With this road, we, we, we parted the Red Sea. So we are happy when people come and say they have a headache. Because we have the opportunity to use the road. We cannot help a man who says, I'm constantly falling into sin. How do I live my life so that I no longer fall into sin? Because the word doesn't do that. It is the word that does that. But because we don't have the word, we are breeding grounds for sinners who know enough that this sin is killing me. They have no idea. They have no clue. How to walk out of the sin. Why? Because they come to us. And we don't know either. So we can't give them anything. Praise Jesus. The consistent focus in Moses' leadership was on the power of God and miracles. It was clear that it is now clear that we cannot survive as children of God on power displays alone. We need water, the sustaining, refreshing life that comes from an interactive relationship with the one who wields all the power. We, that's what we need. That's what will make the difference. Miracles alone cannot sustain the journey through life. The word is sufficiently owned and known when the word is sufficiently known and, and and owned and known known it reduces the need for miracles if every time we see you as a child of god you are believing god for a miracle honestly i think you should go sit by the well because there is a dryness there if everything you know when was the last time you see children of god get up and make a boast it used to be a constant thing in the Bible. Somebody would just make a boast. He would say, as the Lord liveth whom I serve, there shall be no rain by my mouth. There will be no rains. When he's tired of the drought, he will come back and say, rain, come. Rain will show up. When was the last time you heard people make that kind of boast? What do we hear now? We go things like, if it is the will of God, we go things like, um, if you are lying. We go things like, if you follow instruction. Why? Because we need to give God a way out. So we make the man who has come to God to receive all that he needs, we make him feel like he's the one that does not have the capacity to receive. When of a truth, what has happened is that it is just too dry where we are. This, as closely as Moses walked with God, this was an indictment on his leadership.
when your people don't get enough dose of water or the word, they will never be able to recognize that the solution to their problem didn't lie with the man, but it lied with it, laid, it lies with God. That's why if you look at the track record of the children of Israel, every time something happened, they will they will attack Moses. Every time something happened, they will attack Moses. Today we attack our pastors, we attack everybody. Not recognizing that what our problem is in the man, because the man is also trying to find his way. That when we hit dry places, we should go to God. We forget. When a man is dry, he cannot recognize the capacity to move forward is embedded in his personal relationships. We're always thinking about the oil. We're always thinking about the sprinkling of water. We're always thinking uh, um, thinking and focusing on the mantle and the handkerchiefs. But all of those things are fall out of one man's relationship. What is the fallout of your own relationship? So when we have an issue, we run and we pick the handkerchief that is a fallout of another man's relationship. So the men have now made it a business. So they prepare the oil down. And we pay huge amounts of money to get the oil. Why? Because we, are, we, we don't have debt in us. We have no relationship. So we cannot transact for the solution that we want. By ourselves. So we are looking for the man of God, the woman of God, the child of God. The unman of God who will lay hands on us. When was the last time you said to yourself, if Jesus doesn't do it, then it should not be done? When was the last time you made that kind of boast? And said, Yes, Lord, I need this. I need this, Lord. But I'm not going to be asking any man. I'm not going to be discussing it with any man. I'm just going to stay here until you, you, you provide it. If it doesn't come, then maybe it's not you. It's not what I need. When was the last time we did that? Jennifer, I'm going to come back and read your testimony. And I'm going to respond to every comment on this video today. Usually I don't do that. But I feel that every comment on this video today, I think that God picked the people that watch this video today because God wants to move us. Praise Jesus. Amen. So Moses cried to God. Did you see that Moses didn't even have the solution? He ran to God. He said, Father, they've come. They have, they're almost stoning me. Read your Bible. He said, well, Lord, they're, they're almost stoning me. God said to him, take your rod again because that was not the time for God to teach him something else. He only knew the rod. So God said to him, take the rod. But God did something else. Let's read our Bible. And verse number five. And the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel and then thy rod. For the first time, God was saying, take people. You need witnesses this time. Then take the rod with which you smote the river and take, take it in thy hand and go. Verse nine, six, it says, behold, what did he say? I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb. And thou shalt smite the rock. And it shall come, and there shall come water out of it. And the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Please praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Can you see what I'm saying? God said Moses could not do it. He ran to God. God said, take your rod. That's all you know. But this time, you need help. I'm sending you to the rock. I want you to go to your Bible. Praise Jesus. If you go to your Bible in Isaiah 26, you will see who the rock is. He wasn't asking Moses to go to a physical rock. It might have The manifestation might have been a physical rock that day. But this is much more beyond physical things. Isaiah 26 verse 4. 
trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. There is a version that says he is the rock forever. Praise the Lord. Amen. Then when you look at praise Jesus. Amen. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. I said Isaiah 26 verse 4 in some versions refer to God as the rock that is forever. The everlasting rock. That's the way it's called. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4 and did drink all, 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 and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. You want to move away from, from dryness, find Jesus. Stop looking at your pastor. He is the rock of ages. So when God said to Moses, take your mind to Lord, take your rod, go and strike the rock. You know, if you go to Exodus chapter 33, from I think verse 30 thereabout, you will see that it was the exact same thing that happened when Moses asked God to show him his glory. He said, come, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. He was saying, Moses, just like, um, what's his name? Just like Jesus said to the woman at the well, he said to her, he said, if you know who is talking to you and you know what capacity I have to give water, that I can give you water that will make you never thirst again. He said, you would not talk to me the way you are talking to me. And the woman quickly said, give me the water of life. Do you understand it? It was exactly that same thing that we saw in the book of John that was happening in Exodus. God was saying to Moses, Moses is not just a miracle this one's wants. They want water from me. They want water coming from the rock. And guess what happens? I, I, I hope you are ready. I do hope you are ready. He said, smite the rock. Think about it carefully. What did they do to Jesus? They smite him on his side. And the Bible said, water and blood came out. What God was talking about, he wasn't talking about the things that you could touch with your hands. He was saying, today is that day. I need you to come up higher because this is the day that I want you to see that there is a fountain that doesn't run dry. And this fountain is not a fountain that you travel to go and fetch from. This is a fountain that I'm willing to deposit inside of you. If I deposit it inside of you, you will never lack water again. Unfortunately, if you read your book of Exodus properly, you will know Moses didn't learn the lesson. Because the thing that made Moses not make it into the promised land was still water from a rock. You will know that these people just didn't get it. They did not get it. They did not get it. They did not get it. And unfortunately, today, 80% of us still don't get it. So when we see one Christian who gets it, the person becomes a superstar. Unfortunately, that's not the way God ordained it. He wanted all of us to be as stars in the heaven. Do you remember what he said to Abraham? He said, if you can number the stars in heaven, so shall your descendants be. It wasn't only in number. It was also in constellation. We were supposed to shine bright. That's why the Bible says, the path of the righteous unto the perfect day. So when God was saying strike the rock if you notice this time they moved because you cannot get Jesus by sitting in your corner you cannot get to Jesus by the things doing the familiar things that you were doing you cannot get to Jesus with the revelation of yesterday he said take elders move to the rock in Mount Horeb when you get there smite the rock 
and water shall come out of it and the people will drink. Praise Jesus. Let's hear it where I want to land it today. This is God himself we're talking about. This is the rock of ages we are talking about. This is the all in all we are talking about. This is Jesus we are talking about. How can you come before Jesus and not receive respite? How can you come before Jesus and not receive a refreshing? How can you come before Jesus and not get renewer? How can you come before Jesus and not get reviver? How can you come before Jesus and not get restoration? How can you come before Jesus and not get release? How? So how come our homes, our families, our churches, our businesses are filled with dead people. How? How? When we seek God, he finds us. What God was saying to, to me this morning from Exodus 17 was, you need to seek me. So that you will find me. And I remember because, you know, here's the thing for me. I always learn from for myself first. Yesterday I was going to Oregon because I was doing a training for someone there. And in the car, I was just, I was talking to God and I just started to cry. And I said, Lord, I'm tired. I've been on this journey. I'm traveling, 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 traveling. Lord, will this trip not end? I am tired. And God started to say to me, but you are not even seeing the scenery. You are too focused on where you think you are going. You did not even know who you just drove past just now. And the Lord started to speak to me. Ultimately, he said to me, he said, come to me. I, by myself, will move you forward. That's what he said to me yesterday morning. Because we had to leave the house early to go to where we needed to go to. And you know, I didn't even know when I started to cry because it dawned on me that really, sometimes the reason why we get dry is because we are on the trip, yes, but we are watching another man's journey at the same time. Yes, another man's journey at the same time. And as long as I continue to watch someone else's journey, I can't make it. I will be dry. But Jesus, God was saying, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Remember again, Rephidim is a place of rest. Seek him today while he may be found. And all of this, again, I want to say it, a personal relationship trumps a display of power because how many of us know that the bulk of the power we see on display out there is not from God I told us here before that a miracle is only evidence that something supernatural has happened it is not indicative that God showed up the ways of God are more important than his acts no wonder, again, I'll talk about Moses. Moses knew the ways of God. That's why he lasted that long. But Moses was incapacitated when he came to transferring the ways to the people. And a lot of the, our leaders spiritually today are incapacitated. They know it, but they don't have the words to transfer it to someone else. You need a personal relationship. The ways of God are more important than his arts. Refidim was where God tried to make the children of Israel see that. Unfortunately, they were a generation raised in miracles who had no relational debt. No wonder they didn't make it out of the wilderness. The entire journey, they complained. And the entire journey was one miracle after another miracle after another miracle after another miracle. I mean, how many miracles does one man need? We just all need one defining encounter. That defining encounter is God reading you his resume. The moment you see it, every day you go through your life, you're supposed to produce miracles for other people. Praise Jesus. 
water came out, they drank. And Moses called the place, the name of the place, Massa or Meribah. Meribah means, is the Lord amongst us or not? Ladies and gentlemen, if God is amongst us, how come we are so poor? If God is amongst us, how come we are so weak? If God is amongst us, how come we are so beggarly? If God is amongst us, how come we lack character? If God is amongst us, how come we are dying in our droves? If God is amongst us, how come people can't come in contact with us and recognize that God is with us? Moses asked the right question. But he was asking the wrong people because they had no idea. And he was right, asking the right question under the wrong circumstance. He was asking that question of the people to say, you can't you see that there's water out of the rock now? That shows you that God is with us. But I'm saying to us today that we ought to live life at a higher level where it is not the miracles that are on display that show people that we are of God. It is the God in us. When was the last time you went somewhere and they took a look at you and they said, there's something about you? When was the last time? We all gather with the unbelievers, with the Buddhists, with everybody. We gather with them. They don't know the... In fact, in some cases, they look better than us. They act better than us. They speak more in faith than us. They, 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 they do so many things better than we do. And I had been asking God, where did, how come? And God just showed me today, your well is dry. This was Moses chastising the people because once again, this encounter has proven that we, what we all want to know, that the children of God, despite the display of God's power and his presence in their lives, didn't know him for themselves. And this lack of intimacy with God always resulted in bad behavior because of unbelief. When you don't have an intimate, intimate relationship with Jesus, bad behavior will be your second nature. When you finish doing it, you will say to yourself, I don't know how I did it. You don't have a relationship. Pride, arrogance, fear, lie telling, name it, we find it in us. Because we have no depth of relationship. And the issue is even God took this to heart. Because when you go forward, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 16, uh, 6 verse 16, God said to them, do not disobey like you did, or do not murmur like you did in the day of Massa. If you go to Deuteronomy 9.22, God told them, do not disobey me like you did in the days of Meribah. If you go to Deuteronomy 33 verse 8, that is what happened this day at Rephidim. Even though God gave them water, God kept talking about it. He kept talking about it. Because how can God be where you are and you will know it not? How? Did our God become that small that we can't recognize him in our lives? How? I don't know how much time we've done. We've done over an hour. But the truth is I'm done today. I decided I will stop in verse 7 because I wanted to be able to land this properly. So if you have questions, thank you for joining us. There are a lot of people online today and a lot of new people. Jennifer Araka, thank you so much. And you're so engaged. God bless you. Um, Prophetess Jacqueline, Olua Femi, Dele. Um, who else? Yes, Dele John. Um, a lot of people, Pastor Wumi, Sister Stella, um, Prophetess Jacqueline. Thank you so much, Julia. All of you for joining the class today, uh, Stai BA. God bless you. I will now just take time to take questions. If you have questions, please share them. I trust that the Holy Spirit is here. And I trust that he would give us the response or the answers that we need. But beyond that, I want to encourage you. Take the time to go back and watch this video over and over and over. I'm going to go and watch this video, and I taught it. But I'm going to go back and watch it again and again 
Thank you, Mr. Femi. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks for joining the class. So that we can apprehend this truth for ourselves. I don't want to have dryness in my life again. So I am determined that whatever I would take, I will know this Jesus for myself. Not the Jesus that my parents told me about. Not the Jesus that my pastor talks to me about. Thank you so, so much. If you have questions, please ask your questions. But if you don't ask questions, if you don't have questions, then please share your walkaways. God bless you richly in Jesus' name. Physical class, do we have questions? If you have